Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jade Monkey. We're back here in Rust, talking about that Rust console edition, and that's right, electricity. Uh, and this is for the PlayStation, the Xbox, next generations, and everything in between, and even the PC if you're a little cloudy on how power surge works or electricity. So this video is about the power basics, some basic setup. This is a guide across the board and especially focused for us on Rust Console Edition as it should be out by the time you're watching this video, or at least on PTB, which is the testing staging branch. And this is, um, we're going to have solid examples there at the end, and this is going to cover the basics such as power generation, power storage, and power components, and those solid examples that you can use today on the public testing branch. And if you didn't know, we do have a video that we did if you want to upgrade your version of Power Surge, or I'm sorry, of your console edition so you have access to the PTB, I will go ahead and link that video now in the upper right-hand corner. All right, so let's hit the basics, basics, right? All right, so as we covered before, there are three major tenants for this, and it is power source, power storage and power components. But before we can do that, there is some baseline stuff here and that is the wire tool. And let me go up here and show you. It is a default blueprint. It costs two high quality and it's a workbench one situation. And also uh, we'll show you how to click through some of these things here. But if you want to look at the tech tree on the level one workbench, you can see some of these electrical components here. And most of these are going to be a level one and roughly 20 scrap. There are some exceptions, but just keep that in mind. Okay, so the wire tool, once it's crafted and you have it out, it's really nice because you can see these marching ants that show you the flow of electricity. Moreover, you can get closer to the component, and then if you roll over one of the nodes that go outward or in, it will show you how much power is flowing through it and where it's going. And it's very, very useful for troubleshooting. Now, we should have in our version, and if we don't, we'll have it in the future, uh, different colors of wiring, which is very, very helpful for organizing things. And if you need to access that, just hold the reload button and then the wheel shows up and then you can use your analog stick to select it. Again, PlayStation or Xbox. Okay, so let me show you some of the interface for this. So when you click one of these nodes, you're going to see two numbers in the center of the screen. You have a large number and a small number. That large number represents meters in distance. And the small number represents how many times you can attach or make a point. So each time I'm tapping here, tap, tap, see how that smaller number is going down? So what's really nice with this is you can wire things and then like move outside and see how my wire is still active and then you can tape it to the floor, you can tack it to whatever. As long as you're under that threshold for either the points or the distance, you're good to go. Now, I don't know if we'll have the backup feature to kind of like back pedal through there, so we'll kind of have to wait and see what ours is, but there will be a button in the future where you can hit one button and then erase one of the points, which is nice. So if you reach or you're getting close to that point, you'll need to connect it to another component. All right, so kind of show you here, we can walk all the way over here to this door controller and then punch it right in. And then some components, and again, we'll cover this later, um, have like a pass-through and you can keep going. So it's really nice. And let me just show you a different color here. And before we do that, if you'd like to support the channel above and beyond, you can uh, shop for the merch. It supports me, the channel. It is right under this video, either in your mobile application or on your web browser, and you can do it right inside of YouTube. Heck, you can do it while you're watching this video. Okay, much appreciated. So you can do stuff like this. So uh, another good tip for this, if you're playing and you've got this going back to like your battery storage, always try to hide your wires. Don't have it go directly to your battery cabinet. It's as valuable as like the tool cupboard. Maybe not as valuable, but it's, it's up there. So just keep that in mind. And you can already see the flow of electricity by the marching ants. And then if you take it off, you just see the color of the wire. Or if in our case we don't get the colored wires, we'll just have the black for now, but we should have the marching ants. I'm fairly certain we're going to get the colored wires. They're extremely helpful. Okay, so on to the first piece here. We have power source. Very important. Well, arguably, all three of these are important because you can't have any of it without all three of these. So power source. We've got three major areas to cover here. We have the solar panel. We have the windmill, wind turbine. I kind of, you know, uh, interchange the two. And then a uh, gas generator. So um, you can find a solar panel at the outpost. You can buy that outright. You can also buy the wind turbine at the bandit camp. And this one you do, I th wait, no, you can buy this one at the outpost. What am I saying? So let me just go through and show you some of the values for research. So if you look in the right-hand box here, uh, the top row is going to represent what the research cost is. So research, 75 scrap, and then a tier one workbench. And then to craft a solar panel left to right is going to be a level two. I'm sorry. It is a level two, not a level one. What am I doing? Okay, yeah, so it's a level two. Jeez, I messed it up. No, it is a level one. I'm sorry. This is level one. My bad, my bad. 
hundred percent. Okay, so yes, this is <laughs> level one. Actually, let me just double check. I'm pretty sure it is. Yes, it is level one. Okay. A lot of times, because this is so rare, because it takes a piece of tech trash to craft, it is extremely valuable. As you know, tech trash is a thing. So you a lot of times when you find these, you want to keep them and get them going almost immediately to start the battery charge. Look at electricity collection as a valuable resource, like a metal node, a sulfur node. It's just something you want to collect. Bullets, weapons and components, stuff like that. So look at it as another resource. It's collected differently, but it is very valuable. Okay, so um, once we have that there, uh, going over to the windmill, it's going to cost you to research. It's gonna, this is definitely a level 2 workbench. It's going to cost you 125 if you want to uh, sacrifice the object. Uh, you can go over here, and then once you build it, it is a level 2 workbench. 500 wood, 3 gears, and 3 metal sheets, and 10 high quality. Very expensive, but you can already see a use for the metal sheets. A lot of times if you find these, you want to keep them, and then you want to keep a certain amount of metal sheets in a realistic scenario on, on official servers. So... And this one's nice. We'll go over like some of the pros and cons for each of these. I just want to make sure we hit like what these cost. Okay, so this one's going to cost you, the power generator is going to cost you 75. It is a workbench 2. To craft is 2 gears and 5 high quality. Okay, so starting with this guy, it does just that. It runs off of low grade. It will produce 40 units of power on the output, which is nice consistently. But it does consume low grade. If you have access to low grade, it's a great source of power. It's good for FOBs and stuff like that. There's other um, pieces here where you can force stop or force start. We'll get into more complicated stuff in other videos, but that's the basics. You're going to have this power output and then connect it to your circuit. All right, so the windmill is interesting. You never want to put it down this low or around walls like this because it is sensitive to height and surrounding structures. To get the maximum output of a wind turbine, you want to make sure it's up high and not obstructed by other wind turbines or other walls. Not saying you don't get power out of this, but like we got 79, that's pretty good. But um, you get the most by doing that. And because it's the most expensive, you want to make sure you get the most bang for your buck. These are nice, but they're variable. They run through day and night, but they kind of go up and down. And you want to make sure that you've got a good output. And there are limits to the batteries that you collect. So yes, you could just throw up wind turbines and stuff, but also there's a lot of infrastructure that goes with this. And nothing says raid me quite like a giant wind turbine poking out of somebody's base. That means you got something valuable. So you kind of want to start with solar panels, but again, personal preference. Uh, speaking of solar panels, they're right here. Oh, by the way, this one I think can flux between, uh, is it 110? Oh, no, it's 150 and, and uh, I think like one. So just know it can fluctuate, but it does go through the night. It's large, it's costly, it sticks out, um, but it is a good power source. But it is, it does fluctuate. This one fluctuates too. This one is only on during the day. Uh, the maximum output for the solar panel is going to be 20 units of power. And a lot of times you want to have them in pairs. So one in the daytime. And I know this is going to seem weird, but you want to point the daytime northeast and then the nighttime southwest. North, wait, northeast. And then, so yeah, southwest. I know it's weird. It's just because of the island positioning. It's not like straight up like realistic. But anyways, you want to stick these in pairs. And then you kind of add them out. So, so, so in comparison, if you want to keep like a medium battery going, typically you're going to have like four of these. So you're going to have two facing morning and then two facing the afternoon. I, again, we'll get into it. But just note, these are the three power sources and those are some of the pros and cons. This one uh, is fairly consistent during the day, but again, it has hot times and cool times. And it definitely doesn't run at night. This one goes all over the place. And this one is very consistent, but it consumes low grade. Okay, on to the next section, power storage. Also extremely important. Let's do it. So we have three of these as well. We have the small battery, we have the medium battery, and we have the large battery. So again, the breakdown here to just show you the value. So a large battery is going to cost you in research 75 scrap. It is a workbench too. Uh, to craft it, it is 10 high quality and then 2 tech trash. So again, as soon as you find these, you really want to keep them. Um, the medium battery is 75 scrap and then a workbench 2. To craft it, it's going to cost you 1 tech trash and 5 high quality. You can pick up a medium battery for scrap at the bandit camp. So if you can't find any of these out in the wild, just know you can default to buying this. I think it's 75 scrap at the bandit camp. It should be. So just know that that is a purchasing option. A lot of times I like to get started with medium and just keep going. So like if you find a solar panel and you don't have this yet, I would suggest going to the bandit camp and buying this and, and plug up a solar panel and just get your get your charge going. Uh, last one here is the small battery, which is cute. It is a level workbench one. It is 20 scrap to learn. 
It is very cheap, does not require tech trash, and that's five high quality, and that's it. Okay, so again, we'll cover this in other videos, but it is important to know the different areas here. So I know the text is very, very small here. We have charge left, active usage, maximum output, and capacity. And then I added an extra component here that's not on there, but is very important. It's called maximum in. So how much you can put in there, and then beyond 40 units of power for this, it would be wasted. So another reason why you want to really balance all these things out. Again, a video for another time. Okay, so the maximum output of this little guy is 10 units of power. The maximum capacity is 150 rust watt minutes. It's in green. And then the maximum input for this battery, and you can go above this, just know that it's wasted above 40, is uh, 40 uh, power units. And it, that's roughly four times whatever the maximum output is. So in this case, it's 10. So keep it right there for you guys that need to know. Once you play around with the batteries and you have some stuff peaking, this is going to make a lot more sense. But it's important to know because it's not like readily available all the time or at all. So this is the medium battery. It has its uh, maximum output as 50, so you can support four turrets as uh, turrets take 10 units of power, and you'll need some some overhead for the components because they take up power too. You would think you could do five, but really you can't. Um, so the maximum uh, turrets that you can power with this is going to be four. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. So we have capacity that's 9K, that's 9,000 rust watt minutes when it's fully charged. Its maximum output is 50, and the maximum charge you can put into this before it's wasted is 200 power units. Okay, on to the last piece here, the big boy. This is the large battery. Its maximum output is 10 power units. Its capacity is 24,000 rust watt minutes, and its maximum in before it's wasted or after that is wasted, is 400 power units. Now, you're probably like, what does the capacity mean? Well, we're not used to having turrets just run uh, and costing anything, but now when you put them down and they're on, they're going to take um, power. And so, like, the capacity is how long you're going to have to run it. So you really want to make sure you're controlling these as best you possibly can and uh, managing your power as if it's a resource, like bullets, uh, gunpowder, or sulfur, stuff like that. Okay. So to uh, kind of bring things together here, we have a lot of little samples here. The next biggest piece, well, not biggest, but uh, arguably all three of them are large, power components. They come in many different shapes and sizes. But here's the kicker, right? And this is, again, you always pair this one with your power stuff, right? The red brick. Um, here's the caveat with these. All of these units, or all of these components, will take a unit of power or more. So when they're in your circuit and they're actively being used, just assume they take at least one power, if not more. And some of them have special conditions, but for the most part, that's like the rule across the board, so keep that in mind. And a lot of these have different functions. Some of these we, will, we won't cover in this video because they're a bit more complex, like the HBF sensor, which is like a person detector. Uh, logic, which is, let's see if I can remember this one. This one's OR, this one's XOR, and this one's AND. We have the timer switch and stuff like that. Okay, so this is where we're going to be doing some examples here. So here's a couple exceptions. All um, components are going to need some type of power, but there are some exceptions. And those two exceptions are the pressure plate. doesn't mean you can't stick power in it. It just means it does generate its own power, and it's a small burst of power, and it's only one unit of power. Same with the red button. So when you hit these, they actually generate one button, or <laughs> one unit of power. So in this case, let me go ahead and just plug this uh, red button in to this door control. And if I press this once, it sends a unit of power. And again, we don't have anything plugged into this, like a battery or anything. So that's how this operates. And the pressure pad is the exact same way, where you actually plug it in, and it does the same thing. And pressure plates are used for, you guessed it, cab bases. And they're, they're good, but, like, you got to remember, they only send a burst of power, and then that's it. You can already see right there. We stand on it, but notice it opens, and then it shuts. So just know that these can generate their own power. It's kind of nice for, like, resetting other switches or if you need a burst of power to clear something. Um, just keep that in mind. But you can send power to these, uh, and then that will make it that switch go greater than one burst uh, power unit when they're active. Okay, so here's the other piece here, the door controller. Arguably... Probably one of the more important ones, for sure. Let me go ahead and bring this down to my slot here, because we don't want to make this terribly long. So a door controller does just that. You saw it open the doors. So here's how you do it. You put it on the frame of the door, or extremely close. And yes, this does work on large gates, stone and wood. When it's on the door frame of a door that you want to be controlled, and there's a lock on it, whether it's wood or a code lock, once it's keyed in, then you unlock the door so it's green. Go here, pair the door. You know it's paired when it's green. 
then don't forget to then lock your door again. Don't leave it unlocked, okay? And then if you have some type of switch like we have here, we can plug it in the bottom. And then let's go ahead and take this battery and plug this in from the output into our splitter. And now this switch should activate our door controller. And now if you notice, this is taking uh, some units of power out of the battery. In this case, three units of power. And because, um, well, we'll go over that in a second, but it's going through the splitter and then this switch is activating the door and it's keeping it open. Much different than the pressure plate or the red button. So we might as well cover this. If you look at the uh, usage here, you're like, wow, that's three units of power. I thought this thing only uses one. Well, remember, your circuit adds up each component and some of them take more than others. In this case, I, I do believe all three of these components, one, two, and three, are going to take one unit of power. So it makes sense that when they're all active, they're using three units of power. So you can already start to see, because the maximum output on a battery, a small battery, is 10 units of power, and we're well into uh, almost half of it. <laughs> so you can start to see like um, how you really want to be watching your power consumption. And in this case, we only have a 17 rust watt minutes capacity, which means we can have this active for five minutes roughly. So you always want to make sure things are being charged and you're only using the electricity when you need to. Okay, on to the next example here. And this is a, uh, we'll do a more um, in-depth piece on this, but we will have a, a good example of a turret here at the end of the video. But uh, here's another example of a branch. And this is a very important component, and so is the splitter. Actually, you know what, before we hit this, let's go ahead and run over the splitter. So the splitter is great because anything that's plugged into the top will get cut up evenly to each of these that are actually connected. So if you have one, it's just gonna go right through and then spit it out, but it will consume one unit of power here, because remember, at least one power is consumed on every component, I if not more. But in this case, if you connect something else down here, then the splitter is going to evenly, and that's the key word, split the power that comes in at the top between these two nodes because they're active. If you have three of them active, it will evenly distribute that across all three of those. So it's nice if you don't really need to worry about like specific power in that case, but um, that's the con. It's pro and it's con is the same thing. It splits it evenly. So depending on the use case, it can be great and um, it can also be bad. So uh, let's say you need like a lot of power. You only need three units of power for this. But for your turret that takes at least 10 units of power, you don't have enough to divvy up there. Heck, this battery doesn't even put out enough because 10 is the absolute <laughs> maximum. So that can run one turret and that's it. You can't put any logic in between there. So if you need something to run or have very specific controlled power go to a specific area, you're gonna be looking at something like the branch. So let me go ahead and take this medium battery and just plug it in the bottom of the branch here. And you'll see by default, um, it's just going to go off and light this light up. And you're like, okay, well, how does that work? So if you look at the branch, you have an input at the bottom. Then you've got your left-hand side, the branch out. And then you have your right-hand side, the power out. So we have the yellow and we have the green side. So what happens is with the branch, whatever you have this set to, and in this case it's set to two, whatever that configured option is, is going to go off to the left first. It takes priority and it's always on. So whether this circuit's on or not, it's always chewing up two units of power or whatever you set and it takes the remainder and dumps it off to the right. So in this case, we have a maximum output of 50, but we're only using three because it goes up here, the branch uses one, we've configured two to go off to the left, which is not currently being used, and then it's going off to the right and then it's powering up this light. So if you look, we're only using three units of power. Uh, this light and this branch, this other side is not active because we don't have enough power going to the turret because it requires 10 units of power. Uh, we're getting two to it, but since it's not active, it's not burning it. So you're like, well, how does this um, pertain to the, to the branch? Why would you want to do this? Well, in this case, we want this light to be active, but we also need this to be powered, and we need it to have 10 units of power. So when you use a branch, it's, it's like a more specific splitter. So you go up here, and now since that, uh, uh, what is it, the, the turret off to the left needs 10 units of power, we're going to set this to 10. Now the yellow line is taking 10 units of power off of the 50 that's coming out of the battery and sending it to the yellow wire first. And then the remainder goes off to the, uh, the green line, which is our light. So in this case, now this is being powered exactly 10 units of power is exactly what it needs. And then the remainder goes off here, which is what, 39? And it's only using, I think this uses two, so that leaves uh, 37 more units of power. So if you look at our consumption now, we have 11 units of power, that's the 10. And then I think it's only using, well, that's interesting, yeah, because it's then it's um, 
Yeah, and then I guess it's only <laughs> using one unit of power for this. Do they only take one unit of power for these dome mites? I guess they do. I thought I used two. But anyways, um, what's interesting is the branch will sometimes use one unit of power, but if it's uh, using anything above, like, three, it'll automatically just knock it down because we're taking ten off to the side, and then we have the remainder on the right side. So just know that sometimes it'll chew it up and sometimes it doesn't. Look at this black box, the branch, as a more controlled splitter and one that you can configure because now if I put this to two... Now this goes off because there's not enough power going to the turret itself. Nice. Okay, on to the next example here. We have the root combiner. And what this does, the red box, will combine sources of power fr from anywhere. So like even if we need to charge something, so in this case, uh, we'll put this in this, uh, where are you, power out. And then we'll take a solar panel and we'll plug it in the bottom of the root combiner. And so you can take multiple sources of power. So in this case, I think we have how much power coming out of here? We have 20. So we have 20 coming on the right side of the root combiner. And now we're going to have, well, the generator's not on. So really, it's just going to be 20. But if we want to go charge something, did I already take that off? If we want to go charge something, it's going to take that 20 units of power and dump it into here. But then if we turn this on, oops, I didn't put any uh, low grade in there. Now, if you look at the combined power that's coming out, it's the 20 from the solar panel because it's a brighter time of the day. And now it's adding the 40 to it, so we have 60 going into this battery. So you can see how we can combine different things. But also, the root combiner can take things from power outputs like batteries and also combine them. So you can see, since these batteries' maximum output are 10 apiece, this should be 20. Bingo. Then we can plug in things like a switch. And then we can turn on the switch. And we can turn on something like a Tesla coil, which I may or may not be in our first wave of this. But anyways, if you look at this example, you'll also notice that, remember, the maximum input for a small battery is 40, and our input here is 60. In this case, we're actually wasting 20 units of power because it can only charge as fast as uh, 40. And it's already maximum capacity, so uh, you would actually be turning this off because <laughs> you'd be wasting low grade. I was testing you. Okay, so let's go over to another uh, crazy real-world example here. And we're going to have this one, and then we're going to set up like a smaller base that is more likely that you guys will be using. Okay, so over here, we have a, an automatic day and night light switch. And this will use a blocker. Let me just explain what the blocker does here. So we have the main power coming off the battery, which is red. And what happens is the blocker has a condition where if it's met or not met, it will allow this red line to pass through. So in, in this case, it will allow the power from this battery to pass through. So what is that condition? Well, it's kind of inverted. Um, what happens is if the yellow line has power going to it, it blocks the red line from going through. So in this case, what I did was, is I took two power sources, two solar panels, put them in a root combiner, and have it go up to this branch, which takes just two units of power and dumps it into the blocker. I know it's getting a little wild, but then um, it takes a remainder of power from the solar panels and charges the battery with it. So you're like, well, why does this detect sunlight and why does it turn things on and off? Well, if there's no power coming from the solar panels, i.e. it's dark out, there will be no power going to this branch. And remember, the priority is the yellow line. Then that means this blocker will be open. And you're like, well, if you have no power, how can this power go through? Well, this power block, or I'm sorry, this blocker comes from the battery. So if you have it charged up to 150, 50, 150 rust watt minutes, you know that it's pushing power up to the blocker. So in this case, let me see if I can actually bring this up for you. We'll turn this off. And if we have daytime, okay, so if we turn this on, I'm going to change the server time. And what's going to happen is, if it's dark enough, did I not set it? I think we need to set it to like 8 point something. So when it's actually uh, nighttime, you'll see these turn on. You'll see this turn off because it's not receiving any power. There we go. See how the lights just turned on? So it automatically would turn things on and off. So if there's no sun for either of these, or there's not enough power to take the branch, which is two units of power, which is the priority, this blocker is open, which means the battery power can then freely pass through. So it's a nice way to conserve power because, as we know from... Uh, uh, gas lamps and everything else that nobody turns them off. Like, nobody turns them off. They just burn juice. So in this case, because it's so important that, I, again, I have admin time on, so it's technically nighttime. That's where you're seeing the lights on. But it's a good way to conserve power because, remember, power is a resource. Okay, 
So let's go ahead and jump through here. We're going to do a full setup here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take multiple sources here. And this is a realistic setup. We're going to take solar panels, put them into root combiners, put that all combined into the battery to charge a medium battery. That medium battery is going to be controlled by a master switch, which is a good rule to do across the board. This is going to go into a splitter, and then that splitter is going to control multiple sources. This switch is going to control our lights internally, and then the other switch is going to control a turret on the outside, which is also a good rule to have. You really want to pair switches with turrets because it's how you turn them off to configure them, it's how you turn them off so people can authorize, and it's also how you turn them off to reload them. And remember, our turrets are now customizable. You can stick different weapons inside and different components, or um, yeah, it, well, not components, attachments on top of. So it's, it's freaking awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this, and then that should wrap up our basics. Okay, so right here, I'm going to take the output of the solar panel and stick it into the bottom of the root combiner. We're going to go over here. I drag it across to the other solar panel and then put the input. Um, a lot of people ask me, are the solar panels damageable? Yes, but it's usually not worth it for people to smash on those. And you want to stick them on your rooftop. And then a lot of times I'll stick these root combiners and stuff on the inside. Like on the ceiling and to conceal where the wires are going. Just, just so you know. So now all of these are combined. And I don't know what time of day it is. Uh, let's just go ahead and make it afternoon for ourselves so we can see the power coming through. It takes a second for the server to catch up. And now these are actually taking power and they're combining it. And remember, we have the solar panels facing day and then afternoon. It's very important. Or I should say morning and then afternoon. And we have two pairs of that. So that's usually pretty good for a medium battery if you get things started early. So we have a maximum right now going to the battery that's 50. That should be more than enough. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our main power here, which we'll just say is blue, and we'll move it over to the splitter. And one of the reasons why we have this power switch here is because if we were to take this output and throw it to this uh, splitter first, it's going to consume one unit of power at all times because it hits the splitter. What's great about switches are it only consumes a unit of power when it's active. That means since this is off, there's no bleed currently happening on the battery itself. So there's no charge. If I turn this on, it's going to be two units of power because it's hitting this box that's now active, which is one. Then if you follow the blue line, it hits the splitter, and that's another one. So that's two. It's just a nice way to really conserve your power. All right, so in this case, we'll take our green line. That'll be our lights. That comes off of the splitter. And again, it takes the power, and it cuts it evenly. Then we'll have a switch go up here and then hit our light on the ceiling. And again, you can daisy chain these together. And then over here for our turret, we will make it, um, we'll make it red. We'll take the bottom of the splitter here, bring it to our switch. And then I really like to hide the wires the best we can for the turrets. And a lot of times you'll have like a window or something here. And then plug it into the bottom. So now if the circuit's active, we turn it on. Oops. Yeah, we had, okay, now it's on. <laughs> so now it's going to the splitter. And now we have controls for these things like the lights and now the turret. There you go. That is the Rust Power Basics for our update that just happened for Rust Console Edition, but this also applies for the PC version, so I hope this helps out a lot. We'll be having a lot more of these, so be sure to check them out, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Love you. Bye!